Loss is ubiquitous today in the US and globally. Since 2020, the global coronavirus pandemic has visited untold losses worldwide. From the horrific death toll, which of this writing approaches almost 1 million in the US uh, alone and almost 6 million worldwide, to the economic devastation, to intimate losses, such as the foreclosure of collective occasions to grieve the dead or be with loved ones. And this week, we are confronted with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the reality of war with its always staggering toll. Moreover, always in the background is the ongoing man-made disaster of climate change, raising questions about the survival of the planet itself. Loss is thus a universal human experience, but the specific subset of loss that I'm concerned with today is political loss. The pandemic and inadequate government responses to it have exposed differential patterns of racialized precarity, for instance, from the composition of the so-called essential workforce, which is dominated by women of color, to the disproportionate effects of the virus, uh, while others, mostly white, protest any government measures to curb the spread, such as mask, ban mask or vaccine mandates, to enormously unequal global access to vaccines, yawning racial and class disparity at net yawning racial class and national disparities in the impact of the pandemic unequivocally demonstrate that we are not in fact all in this together as politicians are wont to say in moments of national crisis. The losses that accompany a global pandemic are thus made political by the disparate effects of state action and inaction. The same is true of the way existing inequalities exacerbate ostensibly natural disasters. Not all losses are therefore political, but much political activity is about how we respond to loss. I follow Danielle Allen's influential conceptualization of loss as a central feature of democratic politics, which she derives from Aristotle's notion of ruling and being ruled in turn, and Ralph Ellison's reflections on African-American sacrifice as a heroic form of civic excellence. The question of how loss is distributed among citizens is cr thus crucial for democracy. Uneven distributions of the democratic labor of losing, especially along pre-existing hierarchies such as race, barely uh, contradict the fundamental tenets of equal citizenship. But certain kinds of entrenched structural inequality, such as white supremacy, precisely function to obscure this uneven distribution of democratic labor. At the same time, however, we also have to consider how political loss is produced. It's not simply a naturally occurring phenomenon. Rather, political communities and societies have been constituted to produce differential losses and to profit from the losses of non-white peoples. Democratic theorists do often romanticize calls to sacrifice for democracy or frame their examinations of political loss in a reparative vein, calling back to the discussion of repair yesterday, that situates public mourning as a solution to democratic disrepair, which has the paradoxical effect of minimizing ongoing and continuing loss. My work resists that impulse at the same time as it takes loss seriously as a central question for political theory. I will briefly trace what political theorists have had to say about loss. For some, loss is central to the activity of political theorizing itself, and it is a framework through which we can understand the history of Western political thought in particular. Democratic theorists have mourned the loss of political participatory traditions while others have bemoaned the paralyzing effects of left melancholia. The contemporary scholarship on mourning in political theory, meanwhile, has focused on grievability as a ground for solidarity and the democratic possibilities of national public mourning. In contrast, I engage with a much less discussed tradition of thinking about loss, Black political thought, as especially generative for a present moment. Black thinkers have tended to resist reparative approaches to loss that privilege appeals to the state. They have had to grapple with how to mourn when loss is ubiquitous yet unrecognized by the dominant society, with what it means to grieve when loss is ongoing and not repairable. The struggle for Black thinkers has been how to hold on to hope in the face of ongoing loss, not the problematic fixation on loss of 
Freudian melancholia, nor the overcoming of loss that constitutes successful mourning from a psychoanalytic perspective. So what do I mean by political loss? As I've already noted, grief and loss are unavoidable human experiences. As Judith Butler has argued, while there is no quote, human condition that is universally shared, all of us have some notion of what it is to have lost somebody. Loss has made a tenuous we of us all. This means that each of us is constituted politically in part by virtue of the social vulnerability of our bodies. End quote. I share the concerns of her colleague Bonnie Honig with Butler's mortalist humanism, her move to ground the possibility of political solidarity in shared corporeal and affective vulnerability to loss. But Butler's identification of loss as the basis for an ethic of human solidarity illustrates the fact that this is a condition that we're all assumed to experience at some point. Loss may not be a shared experience, but its inescapability is often understood to have important political implications. I, we don't have the same losses, we don't mourn the same losses, but we all have some loss. Yet while loss may be unavoidable, not all losses are necessarily political. Losses become political in part through the process of people mobilizing around them. Consider, for example, two very visible forms of loss in recent decades. The September 11, 2001, and the Me Too movement against sexual violence. Many recent texts by political theorists on mourning, grief, and loss take 9-11 as a starting, as a point of departure because it is assumed to be an indisputable example of national loss and mourning. We would thus immediately recognize the death of a victim of 9-11 as a political loss because it was the result of an attack by foreign actors. In contrast, it required the mobilization of the Me Too movement for the losses women have accrued as a result of sexual violence and sexual harassment to be recognized as more than simply private, personal, individual problems. One sense in which losses are political is thus whether they're the result of state action or inaction, but beyond that, whether they implicate the political community as a whole and require a collective response. Here, my understanding of what makes losses political follows Sheldon Wolin's conception of the political as episodic and instantiated in specific moments when people act together. The category political loss thus does not exist as a pre-existing thing outside of or antecedent to politics. Losses become political as a, as a result of the efforts of different constituencies, activists, elected officials, artists, academics, ordinary people to make them visible and to establish that they require a collective response. But losses do not only become political as a result of mobilization to make them visible. Individual losses are also rendered political by virtue of structural inequalities and systemic disparities. For example, while there's still clearly risks for the mother's health associated with childbirth, an individual black woman's death from complications associated with childbirth is not natural, but rather political when we consider the origins of current racial, racial disparities in medicine. According to the CDC, black mothers giving birth in the US die at three to four times the rate of white mothers. While some of these unequal outcomes can be attributed to economic factors such as access to good health care, studies have shown that minority patients tend to receive a lower quality of care than non-minorities, even when they have the same type of health insurance and the same ability to pay for health care. Moreover, employment opportunities, which determine health care options in the U.S., are also shaped by histories of racial discrimination in the workplace. Current racial disparities in maternal mortality are thus political, even in the absence of direct medical malpractice or negligence. Thomas Dumm, in his meditations on the different pedagogies of grief developed by Ralph Emerson and W.B. Du Bois in the wake of the death of their sons, makes a similar point about how racism shaped Du Bois' loss of his son, while Emerson was exempt from this added burden. If we are to acknowledge his loss, Du Bois's, we must try to reckon, I'm quoting dumb now, we must try to reckon into the calculus of loss, this horrible stain of injustice as part of the experience of Du Bois and not of Emerson. 
And as democratic theorists, we must try to reckon not only his loss, but his loss as multiplied by the losses of millions of others who one by one have so suffered it directly as its most prominent victims and indirectly as witnesses who have so far been muted in response to the damage it has done to us. If we hope to take steps in Du Bois's experience of grief, her first step must be to acknowledge how all of us are stained by the specific pain of what he has experienced and we have witnessed, end quote. While Dumb does not use this term, I would suggest that the distinction he's trying to articulate between Emerson and Du Bois corresponds to my understanding of political loss. Du Bois's loss has to be understood within a larger context, not just of the horrific anti-Black violence that was routine in 1899 when his son died, but also of ongoing racial health disparities that reflect the institutionalized devaluation of Black life. Burgart, Du Bois' son, died from diphtheria, for which a vaccine had become available in the mid-1890s and which led to a precipitous decline in mortality rates, but Burgart died of it, this disease because he did not have access to adequate medical care in racially segregated Atlanta. While he was not violently attacked or killed, he, as people were, adults and children were during this time of racial terror, he was also killed by racism. As Dumb's brief allusion to witnessing as a key civic capacity for democratic citizens suggests, racism has shaped the experience of loss in ways that democratic theorists must contend with if we are to take the experiences of black citizens seriously. Some losses are thus political, both because of the structural disparities that produce them, but also precisely because as a result, they engender a collective responsibility to attend to them. If some but not all types of loss are political, there are some forms of politics that are inevitably about loss. Democracy is one of these, though democratic theorists tend to write about it primarily in terms of empowerment instead. For all citizens in a democracy, however, loss is supposed to be an unavoidable feature of political life. As Daniel Allen has observed, Democracy is inspiring citizens and aspiration to rule and yet requires citizens constantly to live with the fact that they do not. They promise citizens autonomy, freedom and sovereignty, but these cannot be simultaneously realized for all. Quote, no democratic citizen, adult or child escapes the necessity of losing at some point in a public decision. An honest account of collective democratic action must begin by acknowledging that mutual decisions inevitably benefit some citizens at the expense of others, even when the whole community generally benefits. The hard tru truth of democracy is that some citizens are always giving things up for others. Yet, political loss in democracy has not been equally distributed historic historically. Um, and Allen acknowledges that African Americans have done most of the losing in US democracy, um, but she's more sanguine than I am in thinking that we've moved past what she calls the two pronged citizen citizenship of domination and acquiescence. I think we continue to see different expectations of political loss today um, that reflect this uneven distribution of democratic labor. Consider, for example, two articulations of political loss that mobilized citizens in highly visible protests during the summer of 2020. The majority white and often heavily armed anti-mass protests demanding reopening with no restrictions in the middle of a pandemic and the multiracial black led racial justice protests impelled by the police killing of, killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and the shooting of Jacob Blake. The anti-mass protesters were ostensibly motivated by the loss of personal freedom imposed by public health mandates, while racial justice protesters were mourning the state's at best continued indifference to or at worst commitment to black death and demanding the right to live free of state violence. Racial justice protesters were demanding freedom from being killed. Anti-mass protesters were demanding the freedom to kill, to have their personal preferences dominate the collective safety of the ball of the body politic. 
white liberty was supposed to trump black and brown safety. Indeed, the connection between the two kind of protests was explicitly made by anti-mask protesters themselves who claim that racial justice protests are violent and criminal and depict a country under attack. This of course has not been the case and historically white violence and white race riots have occurred with absolute immunity and in many cases outright complicity by the state. A pattern echoed in the kid glove treatment that armed anti-mass protesters and white insurrectionists at the Capitol were met with compared to the heavy handed repressive tactics unleashed on racial justice protesters. White grievance is thus animated by anticipatory losses that simultaneously function to obscure the presently occurring tangible suffering inflicted upon non-white populations whose supposed ascendancy, ascendancy is an existential threat. Yet the politics of white grievance is, and the politics of white grievance is not confined to those who are suffering economic losses. Um, uh, studies of the economic backgrounds of the January 6th insurrectionists, for example, have found that um, unlike the stereotypical extremists, many of the alleged participants of the Capitol riot have a lot to lose. They work as CEOs, shop owners, doctors, lawyers, IT specialists, and accountants. The Capitol rioters and others who continue to believe that the 2020 election was stolen are fueled by the potent rhetorical fiction of a new lost cause, like the one that white Southerners deployed so effectively to reverse the racial justice gains of reconstruction at the end of the 19th century. Today's big lie is being deployed to reverse and prevent any further gains towards racial justice and multiracial democracy. So grief and grievance are both responses to loss, but historically and contemporaneously, black grief and white grievance have been accorded asymmetric attention. Black, and, black grief and white grievance are not normatively equivalent. Indeed, one of the principal claims of the larger book project from which this talk is drawn is that there has been insufficient space for black grief precisely because of the imperative to channel grief into activism to try to remedy racial injustice, even as white grievance has been driven by a refusal to acquiesce to loss, even when those losses are warranted and just. Thus the problem of black loss is that we too often approach it only as a tool for repairing democracy. And now I'd like to share a video with you. Time we're going to hear from his sister, Latitra Weidman. I am my brother's keeper. And when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, make sure you say cousin, mm -hmm. make sure you say son, make sure you say uncle. But most importantly, make sure you say human. Human life. Let it marinate in your mouth, in your mind. A human life. Just like every single one of y'all and everywhere around someone, we're human. And his life matters. So many people have reached out to me telling me they're sorry that this happened to my family. Well, don't be sorry, because this has been happening to my family for a long time, longer than I can account for. It happened to Emmett Till. Mm. Emmett Till is my family. Mm. Philando, Mike Brown, mm. Sandra. This has been happening to my family. And I've shared tears for every single one of these people that it's happened to. Mm. This is nothing new. I'm not sad. I'm not sorry. I'm angry mm. and I'm tired. I haven't cried one time. I stopped crying years ago. Mm. I am numb. Mm. I have been watching police murder people that look like me for years. Mm. I'm also a black history minor. Mm. So not only have I been watching it in the 30 years that I've been on this planet, but I've been watching it for years before we were even alive. I'm not sad, I don't want your pity. Mm. 
I want change. Thank you. Whiteman's powerful act of witnessing illustrates some of the key ways in which black thinkers have approached loss, which I argue are distinct from dominant, the dominant ways in which political theorists have thought about loss. For the late Peter Eubin and Sheldon Wolin, for example, loss is central to the activity of political theory itself. Uh, Eubin argues that much political theory begins with loss. Loss animates it as an enterprise and forms its problematic. In Eubin's account, loss haunts even utopian political visions and political theorists as diverse as the Greek uh, tragedians, Plato, Machiavelli, and Marx can be read as theorists of loss of whose political visions we can then ask, do they present it loss as an aberration in a trajectory of progress or as endemic to the human condition? What rhetorical or poetic devices, what metaphors or prophetic intonations do they use to dramatize the loss they confront and promise to move beyond or redeem? Do they embrace, indulge in, or resist nostalgia, counsel accommodation, endorse revolutionary praxis, or posit some purer realm unsullied by the messiness or undisturbed by the frailty of this world? For Yuvin then, loss is a framework through which we can understand the history of political theory and differentiate the work of various thinkers. Wolin was similarly preoccupied with loss. It was a central or recurring problematic in his work, particularly the loss of participatory traditions that he argued are central to genuine democracy. Loss has a claim upon political theory, he argued, and drawing on Adorno suggested that rather than seeing history as a triumphant parade of winners shoving aside the defeated, what survives of the defeated, the indigestible, the unassimilated, the cross-grained, the not wholly obsolete, is what should interest the theorist. Yet Wolin's embrace of mournful theory simultaneously enabled original insights about the limits of liberalism and the threat of centralized power and resulted in a melancholy relationship with America's democratic past that tended to gloss over its inegalitarian elements. Indeed, Wolin's influential conception of democracy as fleeting and episodic is pervaded by loss and nostalgia. Wolin's democracy grief is thus akin to the left melancholia that afflicts many attempts to mourn radical pasts. Wendy Brown, drawing on Walter Benjamin's concept, diagnoses the latter as a mournful, conservative, backward-looking attachment to a feeling, analysis, or relationship that has been rendered thing-like and frozen in the heart of the putative leftist. She argues that the contemporary left that yarns for past eras of unified movements and class-based politics becomes a conservative force in history. The right has become revolutionary and radical while the left tries to preserve the status quo of the welfare state and civil liberties. And this is a left more attached to its impossibility than what it might accomplish. Wolin's call for political theory to memorialize, memorialize loss has been taken up most recently by the, the contemporary scholarship on mourning, mourning's generative potential for democracy. Moving away from canonical understandings of excessive grief, as in the iconic case of Antigone, as dangerous to the political community, these scholars reconceive mourning as a resource that can enrich democratic politics. Many recognize that loss is not equally distributed and view the invisibility of some losses as the locus of mourning's politics. On this reading, how, ci how citizens organize collectively to mourn has crucial implications for democracy. In this vein, David McIver and Simon Stowe identify models of democratic mourning that avoid certitude, embrace ambivalence, and reject unitary national narrative. And they draw these in general um, from, in Stowe's case, from vernacular African-American mourning traditions as a necessary counter memory to romantic modes of national public mourning. Committed to memorializing unjust injuries against the nation and forgetting those committed within it. Yet these theorists tend to collapse accounts of mourning with, tend to, without paying sufficient attention to mourning's costs, especially for those for whom this is a recurring condition. In contrast to these perspectives, Black thinkers have developed alternative accounts of grief and grievance and their role in politics. There is a long tradition of thinking about loss in African-American political thought. And in the book I'm working on now, I explore what it would mean to approach Harriet Jacobs, Ida B. Wells, and Du Bois as theorists of loss. 
Wells, for example, has been described as an anti-nostalgic thinker. And this is a useful starting point for considering whether black theorists, thinkers are theorists of loss in the same way. Wells and other black thinkers cannot be nostalgic for past eras of utopian possibility in the way that someone like Wolin is, for example, nor in the way that the contemporary politics of white grievance seeks to make America great again. Even for those African-American thinkers who have a more celebratory account of the US founding, the burden of loss is always ongoing. That is because the, ha the harms of racism have not been repaired. The moment, for example, when Frederick Douglass was most optimistic about the possibility of the US becoming a true multiracial democracy during reconstruction turned out to be an opportunity missed rather than enabling celebrations of glorious past. The struggle for black thinkers is how to have hope for the future in the face of ongoing grief, not the problematic fixation on loss or Freudian melancholia, nor the overcoming of loss that constitutes successful mourning from this perspective. As Fred Moten has noted, black mourning is a third category between mourning and melancholia that disrupts both. Black thinkers have tended to resist reparative approaches to loss that priv privilege appeals to the state and insist instead on the need to attend to how black life persists even as black death is an ongoing yet not fully acknowledged racial disaster for black people globally. They have pointed to the ways race works to manage experiences of disempowerment for dominant groups and to obscure the losses of subordinated groups. It, indeed, in the midst of the current pandemic, it is worth recalling that this prize mourners of a previous pandemic during the early years, years of the AIDS crisis when the, when the dishonored had to mount an insurgent mourning for survival. There are of course many differences between the AIDS and COVID pandemics, most notably the fact that the former was stigmatized as a gay disease. But as Dag Dagmawi Wobshet has argued drawing on que queer politics during the height of the AIDS crisis before effective anti-retroviral retroviral therapy, there are important parallels between queer mourning and black grief. During the height of the AIDS pandemic, activists and mourners, he argued, confronted not singular events of mourning, but instead had to respond to repetitive, relentless serial losses whose impact was experienced not as cumulative, but as compounding. AIDS mourners re responded by cataloging their losses, by taking inventory and insisting on memorializing their dead. They compiled lists of the dead, series of name, estimates of body counts. What Wubshed calls a poetics of compounding loss. On the eve of his own passing from AIDS, the black queer filmmaker, poet, and gay rights activist Marlon Riggs connect, connected the mass losses of the AIDS pandemic to a previous catastrophe visited on black people, slavery. In his letters to the dead, one of which was addressed to Harriet Tubman, he asked, don't you see? Oh, I know you do. The chilling parallel between the means by which we were held captive in your time and the methods of our enslavement today. Don't you see the chains, my Harriet, sweet Moses, the chains not so much of steel and the law, but more insidious, the invisible chains linked over centuries of silence and shame. In this latest crisis, our new master is the virus, his overseer silence and his whip, shame. Briggs's invocation of slavery in connection to the AIDS pandemic spe speaks to the superimposition of loss, to the fact that for members of this prize groups, loss is not singular, but multiple and ongoing. The mass losses of the coronavirus pandemic initially shifted the usual economies of suffering such that the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor sparked unprecedented broad national and global protests against racism. But in 2021, the multiracial and anti-racist protests of the summer of 2020 were replaced by the majority white anti-mask, anti-vaccine protests that assert a version of individual freedom that recognizes no obligations of care and concern for fellow citizens. Riggs's concatenation of loss is instructive about these disparate protests, which are linked by, white, by what they tell us about how citizens respond to loss. It points to the way the unequal dispersion of loss within the racially dissected body politic has also resulted in the development of different civic capacities. Some citizens refuse to accept loss, however minor, necessary, or legitimate, 
while others have had to learn to be resilient in the face of loss to find ways to balance grief and grievance. Riggs articulated an intergenerational politics of care that honored Black life in the midst of grief and death and called Black people to a praxis of active witnessing. He wrote, to Harriet, my sweet Moses especially, I thank you for having led me from the forest to the river and commanded me to wade. Repayment, my dear dead beloved, is impossible. But what I have learned from you, I now pass on. As Harriet walked with me, I now walk with others. And as Harriet held my hand, we must hold each other, says each of us must be a witness even now. As the virus continues its course through my veins, I know nonetheless I will reach the other side one way or another. Riggs's connection to Tubman, his sense that she has guided him as he hoped his work and life would guide others after him, created an intergenerational community of Black witnessing to loss but also survival. Thank you.